So far, we've been talking in fairly general terms about water potentials. I'd like now to show you water potentials in action. We're going to demonstrate this using a device known as a Healy-Shaw cell, which sounds more impressive than it is. Our Healy-Shaw cell is simply two parallel glass plates with soil sandwiched in between them. We're going to look at what happens in soils when we change the matrix potential. We're going to look at two kinds of water movement. The downward percolation of water from the surface, as might follow a rainfall, and the upward movement of water that might occur from a water table underground. As you watch the video to follow, please keep these three things in mind. First, how should different types of water potential interact with one another? Two, how would you create an energy budget of water movement using the concept of the water potential? And three, what do you think would be the effect of adding other forms of water potential to the mix? Let's now turn to a demonstration of some of these general principles. For our demonstration, we're going to use a device known as a Healy-Shaw cell. The Healy-Shaw cell is a common tool in soil science, but in our case, it will just be a sandwich of two glass plates that contains a slab of soil that we're interested in studying. We're going to use this simple glass soil sandwich to observe how the interaction between matrix and gravitational potentials affects the water movement in soil. But let's first show you how we construct our Healy-Shaw cell. Here are the pieces of the apparatus we're going to construct. It's simply two glass plates, some neoprene rubber spacers, and some clamps. You start by laying out the spacers on the sides and the bottom of one glass plate, and you carefully lay the other glass plate on top. Tuck in the spacers so they are lined up nicely with the sides, and then very carefully apply the clamps to one side. Turn the cell around and adjust the spacers again. Then clamp the other side. And there's your Healy-Shaw cell. You may have to make a few adjustments here and there to make sure all the spacers are lined up properly. Once everything is in place, reapply the clamps very carefully and you're ready for the next step. Here's the assembled Healy-Shaw cell. The next step is to fill it with soil. We're going to use dry sand for our demonstration. This is sand from a farm in the western Kalahari. We've improvised a funnel by cutting the top off a milk carton. We just pour the sand in. It flows very nicely into the cell. We top up the sand to the very top of the cell. And here's the Healy-Shaw cell, filled with sand. We now move to the laboratory for our experiment. Here, we're going to show you how matrix potential in dry sand draws water up against gravity. We lay the Healy-Shaw cell down horizontally. Then we remove the bottom spacer very carefully and replace the clamps. We had to be very careful not to let the soil come out the bottom. We then make a new bed of sand in a tray and very carefully tilt the Healy-Shaw cell up vertically so that the sand within the Healy-Shaw cell is now continuous with the bed of sand in the tray. There's quite a bit of glare on the glass of the Healy-Shaw cell, and this might interfere with our photographs. So we rig up a stand out of more clamps and tilt the Healy-Shaw cell slightly so that the glare is not so obvious. We then top up the Healy-Shaw cell the rest of the way with sand to replace what was lost. We tidy things up by evenly spreading the sand in the tray. And we also get rid of sand that has spilled onto the sheet of black paper we place in front of the Healy-Shaw cell, again to minimize reflections from the glass plate. In this experiment, we're going to be measuring the matrix forces that draw water up into the sand against gravity. We take a photograph of a card so we can be sure later just what we're filming. You can see this is a nice glare-free face of soil. We then set the camera taking pictures once per second for time-lapse photography. I'll start by adding water to the tray. And you can see the water being drawn up into the sand as we pour. 
and you can see we're adding enough water to saturate the bed of sand the Healy Chaucel is resting upon. Here it is a little bit later, and you can see that the water is still being drawn up into the sand. Drawing the water up takes work, and the potential energy doing the work is the very strong matrix potential within the fine-grained sand. We're going to compare the matrix forces in dry sand against sand that has some moisture already in it. You can see the effect of this slight bit of moisture by pressing the soil together in our fist. It clumps together. Dry sand, on the other hand, does not clump. It flows very easily. Before we get to the actual demonstration, let's take a moment to review a fundamental relationship between matrix potential and what's called the gravimetric water content of the soil. Gravimetric water content is simply the mass of water contained in a given mass of dry soil. You can think of it as a kind of soil water density, except in this case it's a dimensionless number, with units of grams water over grams soil. You often see it expressed as a percentage value. You've already seen one of these graphs that plots matrix potential versus gravimetric water content. Matrix potential is always negative, as we've said already, and drier soils have stronger matrix potentials. The effect of a change of water content is dramatically different at different water contents, however. In wet soils, a particular change of water content, as might happen when rain percolates into the soil, changes matrix potential only slightly. In dry soils, in contrast, the same change of water content will produce a very large change of matrix potential. This same pattern applies to most soils, but the relationship will differ depending upon soil type, and it varies in a sensible way with the typical grain size of the soil. Clays, which have typically small soil grains, will have matrix potential curves that are shifted to the left whereas loamy and sandy soils, which have larger grain sizes, will have their matrix potential curves shifted to the right. Grain size is important here because the size of the soil grains determines the size of the pores between them. The smaller the pore sizes, the stronger the matrix forces will be, and the farther to the left the matrix potential curve will be shifted. We're going to use our Healy Chaucel to demonstrate two ways that matrix potential and gravity potential can interact. The first will look at downward percolation of a known quantity of water applied to the top of the soil, 10 cubic centimeters or 10 milliliters of water to be precise. The second will look at how effectively water is drawn upward through the soil by matrix forces working against gravity. In both instances, we're going to use a relatively coarse-grained sandy soil from the western Kalahari, taken from along the Nosob River in southern Namibia. We're going to compare the movements of water in sand that we've dried in the sun with sand containing its normal water content. So we're going to be comparing water movements when water potentials, matrix potentials are down in this region for the dry sand against matrix potentials up in this region for the damp sand. Okay, without further ado, let's go to the demonstration. First, let's look at the time-lapse videos of water moving through the soil in the Healy Chaucel. First up is the percolation of water downward in dry sand. We've added 10 mils of water to the top of the soil, took photographs every two seconds, and strung them together into this time-lapse video. Let's watch it again and you can see that the water percolates downward slightly and stays there as if suspended. Over the longer term, the water continues to percolate down, but it seems to go in fits and starts. Here's a question. What do you think is going on here? Next up is the same experiment, but now with 10 cc's of water percolating through slightly damp sand. It seems that the water percolates downward much more quickly. Let's watch it again. We'll analyze this movement momentarily.
In the next two videos, we're going to look at how water is drawn upward from a pool of water at the bottom of the cell. We add water to the bottom of the tray, and water is drawn upward by matrix forces in the soil. This video is for the dry sand. Let's watch it again. And finally, we're going to look at how water is drawn upward through slightly damp sand. Let's watch it again. It looked like there were differences in how water moved in the dry sand compared to how it moved in the damp sand. But the only way to tell this for sure is to quantify the vertical movements of water. We'll start with the downward percolation of water. We're going to confine our analysis to the first minute after adding the water because that's where the major difference seems to show up. We're going to plot percolation depth, that is, how far downward from the upper surface that the front of percolating soil water can be seen, versus time elapsed from adding the water. We're going to use a very handy image analysis program called ImageJ. It's very powerful, it's open source, and it's free. Here's the website where you can go to get a copy for yourself. We've used ImageJ to measure the distance of the percolating front of water from the top of the soil. Here are the results for the dry sand in green, and here are the results for the damp sand in red. The difference is quite obvious. When the sand is dry, water percolates downward to only about one and a half centimeters depth, and then it stays there. When the soil is slightly damp, however, water percolates farther downward and faster. By the time one minute has passed, the water in the damp sand has percolated downward to four and a half to five centimeters depth. Let's now turn our attention to water being drawn upward through soil by matrix forces. This takes place over a longer frame of time, so we're going to be looking at water movements over the course of 10 to 20 minutes from the time water was added. We're measuring the height to which water is drawn upward from the base of the cell. Here are the results for water being drawn upward through dry sand in green, and here are the results for water being drawn upward through damp sand in red. Again, we see some quite striking differences. When the sand is dry, water is drawn up very quickly and to a higher level than is the case when the sand is slightly damp. There, water is drawn up more slowly, and it doesn't reach the same height as when the sand is dry. Okay, those are our results. Let's now use the concept of the water potential to try and make some sense out of them. Let's start by reminding ourselves of the relationship between matrix potential and gravimetric water content. We'll just look at one hypothetical graph for sand. Let's look at the results for percolation first. Here are two photographs of the Healy Shaw cells taken at one minute after the water was added. The top photograph is of damp sand, and the bottom one is of the cell containing dry sand. If we look at what we expect the matrix potentials to be, the damp sand will have a weaker matrix potential than will the dry sand. I'm using my words carefully here. I'm comparing matrix potentials using words like strong and weak because the negative values associated with matrix potentials can be confusing if we use terms like greater or lesser. The damp sand has a weaker matrix potential, even though numerically it's greater than the matrix potential for dry sand. Remember, though, that matrix potentials are essentially suction pressures, and this means that the weaker matrix potential exerts a weaker suction force, even though the actual water potential is quantitatively higher. Okay, let's pick apart the forces moving water during percolation. In both cells, gravity will be drawing water down with the same force, whether the sand is dry or damp. 
This is why water flows downward in soil, after all. But gravity will be opposed by the matrix potential, which acts to draw water inward, which in this case opposes the downward movement of water. Because the matrix potential in the dry sand is stronger than the matrix potential in the damp sand, it opposes the downward force of gravity more strenuously than in the damp sand. The consequence is that the water percolates downward faster and to a greater extent in the damp sand than it does in the dry sand. Okay, let's apply the same logic to water being drawn upward by matrix forces from the bottom. Here are two other photographs, these taken at 10 minutes after the water was added to the bottom. It's obvious that the water has moved upward farther when the sand is dry compared to when it's damp. Again, there will be a gravitational potential acting on water in both Healy Shaw cells. But now, as the water is drawn upward, its gravity potential increases. Remember that the gravity potential is the gravitational acceleration g times the density rho times the height h to which the water has been raised. The water will come to rest at a height where the gravity potential has a value that's equal and opposite to the matrix potential. Thus, we see that in dry sand, where the matrix potential is stronger, the water is drawn up to a higher level than it is in the damp sand, where the matrix potential is weaker. The stronger the matrix potential, the higher the water will have to be drawn upward for the gravity potential to come into equilibrium with the matrix potential.